Common Ground Committee is a grassroots organization, and we're focused on bringing light, not heat, to public discourse. And one of the things we've learned is that if you want to bring light to a conversation, it's a good idea to listen first. What is the role that our political leadership can play in that issue? And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. And I have to say, I think we have a pretty awesome panel to talk about that particular topic, don't you think? <laughs> and so, why don't I introduce you to them? First, our moderator is Wendy C. Thomas. She's the editor and publisher of MLK 50 Justice Through Journalism, a year-long nonprofit reporting project about economic justice. She was a 2006 Harvard Neiman Fellow and is currently a contributing writer to the Christian Science Monitor. Wendy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And next, our distinguished panel first, Michael Steele. Michael is the former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland and the former chair of the Republican National Committee. And he made history both times by being the first African American in those roles. And he is currently uh, the co-host of Steel and Unger on Sirius XM's POTUS channel, my favorite channel. <laughs> Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to be here. And on my immediate left is Donna Brazil. Uh, Donna is the former chair of the Democratic National Committee. Now, she has worked on every presidential election since 1976. And in 2000, she became the first African-American woman to serve as the campaign manager for a presidential campaign of a major political party. That was the campaign of Vice President Al Gore. And most recently, she's written a book, a New York Times bestseller, and it's called Hacks, the inside story of the break-ins and breakdowns that put Donald Trump in the White House. Donna, welcome. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for being with us today. And so with that, Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Throughout this entire forum today, we're going to go beyond agreeing what the problems are and start seeking solutions, um, both what the government's role should be and then what the role of us as individuals uh, should be. So we're going to start with what happened last year here in Charlottesville. We remember when hundreds of white nationalists, white supremacists, descended upon the city. They were here to protest the city's decision to sell a statue of General Robert E. Lee. Uh, they marched with flaming tiki torches. They were chanting Nazi-era slogans. Um, and then they violently clashed with counter-protesters. Uh, Self-proclaimed white nationalist Richard Spencer was there. And among the things he shouted into a megaphone, what brings us together is that we are white, we are a people, we will not be replaced. 32-year-old uh, Heather Heyer was killed when a, cloud, a car plowed into a group of counter-protesters. So after that tragic weekend, our Supreme Court reaffirmed that hate speech, including racially offensive speech, is protected under the First Amendment. And what's not lawful in our country is when speech is used to incite violence, of course. Um, yet, according to a 2017 Brookings survey, 44%, 44% of college students believe hate speech is not covered under the First Amendment. Uh, so Donna, my question to you, are we at a place in our nation where our hate speech laws need to be reevaluated by Congress or the courts? Well, I think we're in a place now where all of those uh, values that we cherish, whether they be constitutional amendments or part of the Bill of Rights or part of our, what I call the platform of our freedom, they need to be reexamined, retaught so that there's a common understanding of what we mean when we talk about freedom of the press, hate speech, right to assemble, et cetera. I think we've come far in, this, in our society where we know that certain things that we say or certain actions we take can inflame the conversation, can create 
what I call a backlash, but simply we also know that it's plain wrong. You know, I grew up at a time, Michael, I, I, I may be a day or two older than you, we haven't checked each other's age, uh, but I grew up at a time when I witnessed uh, people marching. Uh, they were marching for civil rights, for, for equal justice under the law. They were marching so that those quote unquote signs would come down, whites only, et cetera. Um, but we're at, a, we're at a tipping point moment in our democracy where I think the lines have been blurred. People don't know because of social media uh, and other quote unquote useful tools that came about after my ex-boss inspired the invention of the internet. Um, <laughs> People no longer know how to communicate their values, their ideas, without you know, ruffling other uh, feathers. So we have to get back to a place, I think, in society where we can foster civility in our conversation. We need new, what I, I think in the 21st century, we need a new vocabulary to talk about race. We need a 21st century Voting Rights Act. We need a 21st century way of looking at all of our laws, uh, and, and as well as our speech. So I don't know the legal answer to it, but I know from a political perspective, we need to teach civics. We need to teach the common decency and values that allowed our forebears to uh, be able to come up with this great enterprise called, you know, we the people, a government representative form of government. We've lost it. I, I, I would agree with that, but here's the rub. Um, who's going to teach it? Am I going to teach it? Or is your mama and daddy going to teach it? What we see right now and what we witnessed last year in Charlottesville was learned behavior. Uh, young men and women in their, in their you know, khakis and izods and their loafers, they didn't have a hood. They weren't wearing a hood. They didn't have a white cap on their head and a you know, cross. Uh, they had tiki torches, all right? They went to Walmart and bought out their supply of tiki torches. So I agree 100% with Donna in terms of moving back into that space where we have a civil conversation. But folks, it's got to start in a neighborhood. It's got to start in a community. It's got to start most especially in a home. What are we teaching our kids? I, I, I relate this story to you um, in terms of this idea of the learned behavior and why even when you look at that, that time span going back five years, five minutes, 10 years, 20 minutes, whatever, um, you get into a moment where you see, uh, see it raw. I have a friend of mine who, this was back in the early 1990s, was playing out with her young kid in DuPont Circle, DC, um, and her kid was playing by himself. So this young white woman came up with her kid, her son, and as kids do after about three minutes of sensing each other's presence, they started playing. The mother then went over to her son and snatched her son up off the ground and said, what did I tell you about playing with them? So who's responsible for that? What's the expectation of that child later on in life in his encounter with a young African-American male or young African-American woman or, or Hispanic? or someone else who does not look like him. So we got to have the conversation, but we got to talk to a whole lot of parents. We got to bring a whole lot of families into this conversation because while the, the civil rights march continues and while there's been a lot of ground covered, there are a whole lot of folks who got off that road or never got on that road who are still teaching that bad behavior to the next generation that bad way of thinking. Um, so I think for me, uh, I want to have that honest conversation starting with, so how are you raising your kid? <laughs> what are you teaching them? Because that's what's gonna get carried outside the home into playgrounds, into academia, into business, downstream. So I feel like I hear you both saying uh, there's a role for families, communities to kind of uh, it's better. an absolute role from my perspective. But when we get to the point where they're with the tiki torches and the khakis, what would be the government's role then? Do you see a need to? 
Uh, as long as there's not uh, violence associated with it, uh, they're protected with their tiki torches to go and protest and say whatever they want to say. And I would defend their right to, to gather and protest, carry their little tiki torches, uh, and, and say whatever they want to say. But when you get in your car and drive it into a, a crowd of people, yep. that's a whole different conversation, and that's a whole different level of engagement by uh, the government at that point which should rightly step in and do its duty. Um, but I don't see the government having a role in limiting your, your ability to go out and make that protest. Just as you show up with your tiki torches and your inflammatory language, I'll show up with you know, my friends who will stand with the Constitution and say, this is not America, this is wrong. Uh, and so I think that that space has got to be protected. I agree with Michael, and it has to be protected, but we also have a role to play because I, I also think in our churches, in our community, uh, in our public halls of discourse, we also have to reinforce the notion that bigotry in all of its form is wrong. Um, you know, Michael, 50 years ago this month when Dr. King was assassinated, that evening when my parents came home, along with my grandmother who was there, uh, to call all of us in her room in the order of our birth, Cheryl, Sheila, Donna, Tater, Chet, Lisa, Dimitri, Kevin, Ziola. I told you we were Catholic. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we sat down, we started praying, uh, and she said, we have to pray for Dr. King, and we did. We have to pray for his family, we did. And then she said, and we also have to pray for those who committed this act of violence. Right. And she didn't say it that way. We have to pray for the person who murdered him. And I raised objection because I had the biggest mouth of the nine. And I said, why? Why do we have to pray for the, you know, the person who shot Dr. King? You know, back then I, I was a little militant. And, and a she's- little? A little. Oh, okay. Just a little. Just a little, okay. As tiny as my feet were back then. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to know why, and my grandmother said, because that's what Jesus would want us to do. We had to that's pray right. for everybody. And that taught me something. And that in the, and here, here was my grandmother who, was born 22 years after slavery ended. My grandmother, who had spent all of her adult life living in the segregated South in Jim Crow, um, she was still filled with enough compassion and love to teach us that as children. And that sticks with me to this day, that we're not called to hate, we're called to love. Right. And I'm telling you, it's hard. I found myself last Easter, every Easter I go to church, and I pray for someone. And last Easter, I was praying for Donald Trump. Oh, no, no, no. Dr. King said, do not let any person, any man, bring you so low as to hate him. And I was reminded of my grandmother again last year. And I have been praying for our president ever since. And the reason why I pray for him is it's somebody who worked very, very hard uh, to ensure that he did not get in the White House. You know. He knows me. <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> I pray for him because we only have one president at a time. Mm -hmm. I still believe that, you know, one day he may wake up and see the light. <laughs> but that, that concept of love, it comes out of the Bible. It comes out of our duty as not, I, I think, as Christians, those of us who are Christians, but even as non-Christians or non-believers. Love spreads quicker than hate. Love is powerful. And love erases fear. And I think what drives racism, the reason why we can't it's root fear. it out, is fear. It's fear fear it's the fear. unknown, yep. fear of the other. And, you know, we have a long, Michael said it's learned. It is learned behavior. My little godson is 22 months old. And I'll never forget a couple of weeks ago, Michael, he's a white guy. Mm -hmm. And I raised him for seven weeks, probably the most important thing I ever did in my life. I took maternity leave from work and I never had a baby, but I was raising this child because his mother was sick. She was ill after birth and they needed someone. And here I, I'm with Kai and he calls me my Nana. I am his Nana. He also, every time he spills something, he also said, Nana did that. Uh, but that's okay. <laughs> he knows I'm a troublemaker. Uh, but one day Kai and I were sitting out on the porch and he looked at my skin and he looked at his skin and he looked and looked and then he finally did this. Mm -hmm. Like he's, like it's almost as if it's, he didn't see anything. He didn't see any difference. Right. And I am so honored now that, you know, 22 months later, this is last night when I got home from California, and he couldn't, I heard him from next door, Nana, he loves me, I love him. This is a boy that I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with. 
So we want to talk, um, you, you just mentioned fear and right. this hate coming out of fear and this kind of segues into our next topic which is about the, the justice system and the role that that plays in, in creating or, or maintaining a racial divide. And so um, some of the deep racial tensions we see in American life you know, underlie how blacks and whites see police in their communities um, as well as their reactions to deadly encounters with law enforcement. According to Pew Research, six in 10 Afri uh, Americans, six in 10 Americans overall, regardless of race, say that the deaths of black people during recent police encounters signal a broader problem between African Americans and police. Now at the same time, uh, a 2017 Pew survey also shows that a majority of police officers say that these same high profile fatal encounters um, have made their jobs riskier, aggravated tensions, between police and African Americans and left many of them afraid to fully do uh, their jobs. Um, of course, we all know earlier this month uh, about the two black men who were arrested at a Philadelphia Starbucks after an employee there complained and called police and said they were loitering. And this wasn't a fatal encounter, thank God. Um, but Michael, question for you, what's the government's role in establishing some, some trust? between African Americans and, and the police? Well, to the extent that you have uh, police, um, you know, that are governed and controlled by, you know, state and local uh, governmental agencies and jurisdictions, uh, they need to be on the front line of not just assessing, but then uh, putting in place the kinds of reforms that are necessary to get us to a spot where we're actually doing real police community relations. A big part of the mistrust that exists comes from the fact that um, police, probably since 2001, since 9-11, uh, have had a very different role uh, in our communities. Uh, some refer to it as a more militaristic role. Uh, others, you know, refer to a bit more of a security role. However you define it, you can really see a clear differentiation in the mindset and the thinking, the move away from the level and the kind of community policing that would have been done in the past. So as an example, um, instead of, and I know some jurisdictions have tried to do this, we, we certainly were uh, involved in it in Maryland uh, when I was lieutenant governor working with the county and local police officials taking a serious look at where your police live. When I was growing up, the cop who walked the beat in my neighborhood knew me, and he knew the other fellas in the neighborhood. He knew who the troublemakers were, right? So that if something happened, he knew not to look at me because I wasn't a troublemaker, because my mama had a belt with my name on it, and that was enough. <laughs> Didn't need to be in the trouble with the law because at home was worse than anything the police could do, right? Um, but that's not necessarily the environment today for a whole host of reasons. But the one constant is still the presence of the police and the lack of community engagement where they actually know these young men and women who are growing up in this neighborhood. But you can't do that when you don't live there. You can't do that when you live in the suburbs and you're policing the city. And, and that's, that's a big part of it. When you don't know uh, where the trouble is and who the troublemakers are, you begin to look at everyone and every community yes. as part of that problem. And so when you walk into it, um, and we've seen too many examples um, of it, uh, where, for example, you look at a Tamir Rice, 12-year-old uh, kid, who you know is is in a Walmart or some store you know with a BB gun, and he's immediately seen as a threat because what's called in about him makes it sound like he's a threat. And instead of stepping back and assessing the environment, and that cop looking and saying, "Oh, it's Tamir. Tamir. Tamir is not a problem," he goes into it thinking that all he sees is a, a, an African American individual doesn't matter, child, adult, doesn't matter. African-American individual with a gun. And then we know the rest of that story. And again, just played out this past uh, couple of weeks in Philadelphia, you know, now sitting while black is a problem if you're in a Starbucks. Because 
if you don't uh, order something, you're immediately considered loitering. Now, I don't know how many of y'all go to Starbucks, but I've been in a number of Starbucks where I have not immediately ordered something with my friends and others uh, and not, getting, not been thrown out or not had the police called on me. So what's changing? What is part of this, uh, this culture where this fear is sort of bubbling up about African-American young men, um, uh, boys, and even women now finding themselves in this particular crosshairs. So for me, it's how the community and the police as law enforcement come together. And the center of that is gonna be our city councils, our mayors, our governors, our state legislators, who are assisting them in putting in place the kinds and putting the money behind, to be honest, the kinds of programs that focus on rec centers, community centers that can be gathering points, constructive gathering points where police and, and kids can come interact. Putting a police officer, Donna, in a classroom or a school, mm -hmm. um, to me, just creates a further barrier. You sound like you're saying state, local, local involvement. Donna, would you agree? A hundred percent. I mean, after all, we pay their salaries. And, role and we, there? there's a federal role because there are federal police, there's a state and local role, and we have to train our officers. But we were taught as children to respect law enforcement. That's right. We were taught to right. respect anyone in really in a uniform. I'll never forget when the mailman would walk up, hello, sir, goodbye, sir, you know, the, the milkman, hello, I was afraid yeah. because our yeah. parents, they drilled it. We also grew up in a household where my uncle Nat was a policeman. You know, my cousin Ethel May was married to a sheriff, and God knows we, we didn't mess with him, no. not in the parish I grew up in. And, and so there was a healthy amount of, as you said, we, the police lived in the neighborhood. Familiar. We knew them, Familiar. and God knows, if you were out at night and they saw you, oh, ooh, they were gonna talk. Yep. Nowadays, we're, we're disconnected. Um, and, and the fear is just over the top. And so society, this, we have to really understand what's happening and why we need to root out racism. And we also have to train, but there's a role for government in this. So, you know, I hear both of you, you very passionate about um, what it's like to be, be uh, pursued, just the color of your skin right. seen and, and nothing else. So in that, in that context, uh, let's think about profiling. Now some would say that that's a, a useful policing strategy. Um, yeah. Should government be allowed to pursue that? Well, I, I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted about the profiling because I, I've been a victim of it, but I also get the necessity of it. I understand how it can be used constructively um, to put together the kind of identifiable information uh, to recognize criminal behavior, uh, activity, and criminals themselves. There are profiles that these individuals fit. They just do. I mean, it's, it's like some of the brightest minds in the FBI and those very special divisions with, with, uh, with sexual victims, et cetera, have an ability to go out and profile the type of perpetrator so that they know how to go about catching these folks. So there's a very fine line there. And this is where I think government um, can, can be very helpful and in helping to draw that very fine line very clearly uh, and assisting to make sure we don't cross that line. Um, uh, and, and, and that whether it's law enforcement at the federal level or law enforcement in your local community, understand very clearly where those lines are and that you do not, you're not allowed to just randomly go out and start profiling people uh, in a neighborhood or a community or begin to project your own biases through that profiling onto those individuals. Um, and there are safeguards in which you can check that to make sure. I mean, it's no different than when you go to, you take uh, you know, a request for a warrant to a judge. It is based on a whole lot of information that's been gathered, right? And you've got to present to that judge in a very clear way, uh, not just how you gathered this information, but whether or not this information it actually warrants the warrant, all right? And there's, so, so Donna, it, there's no you, difference there. So Donna, would you agree useful policing tactic at times? 
I, I can understand Michael's reasoning behind his arguments that used properly, profiling can help with, as, a, as a strategic law enforcement tool. However, in reality, the profiling sometimes is overblown and without proper training and- It goes back to that, yeah. You know, again, we're, we're in a situation where people can be stopped simply because of the way they look. Uh, and as, as we all know, beyond policing, profiling has other, uh, what I call outdated usefulness. I mean, I hate the fact that, I shouldn't say the word hate, I dislike the fact that I still have a hard time getting a, tan, a, a cab in Washington, D.C. Uber and Lyft has really given me other options other than walking and trying to find the bus stop. Um, but we, profiling has, has, um, has been used to the point where I think it is, it, it is not, it has to be perfect, it has to be better. Because so many, not just unconscious bias, but implicit bias, and of course, so many unintended consequences happen as a result of racial profiling. We still have gender stereotypes that we need to eliminate in our culture and racial stereotypes that persist despite you know, hundreds of years of not just academic studies, but others that you know, to be so-called a black person doesn't necessarily mean that you know, we are somehow or another less than or greater than any other human being. So I don't, racial profiling, again, without the proper training, yeah. well, I'm can not I, there. Can I, can I just jump on I'm that? On, on, so th th there's the government side of it, and I know a lot of what we're looking at and talking about is the role of government, whether it's you know a progressive role or a limited role, however you want to look at it. But I would also submit that while we're looking at government, we also have to look at our own society as a whole. And I'll just give my own personal example. So I'm a sixth year lawyer in one of the largest international law firms in the world at the time. Uh, I'm closing, I closed on average in any given month anywhere from 30 to $120 billion worth of securities, all right, as the lead finance attorney. So I do my closings every 30 days in New York. A lot of the work that's done is done by phone, all right? Then you go to New York for the closing. So we had this closing, something like a $60 billion transaction. I'm representing the financee, uh, the financiers, the underwriters. So I go up to do the closing. Now, we've spent the last 28 days talking to each other on the phone. Now, I've got a very English name, Michael Steele. And so I go up. I've got my box of papers coming in. I come into the conference room, set the box down. And this lawyer comes up to me and goes, may I help you? And I go, I'm here for the closing. And he's like, oh, okay, well, you can just sit that over there. Thank you. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So I set my box down over there, and I sat down at the conference table. Two minutes later, he comes back. He's like, may I help you? I said, no. Because <laughs> I knew exactly what was going on. I was not supposed to be in that room because there was no black person on this deal, but it was a black man who was running the deal from the first of the month to that very moment. And the fact that they didn't know my skin color, you know, said a lot. But what said more was when they found out, when I said, oh, I'm Michael Steele, I represent the underwriter. And I had to take this young lawyer aside and go, now I can tell the underwriter that we just don't need to do this deal because you seem to have a problem with me closing it. It was, oh, no, 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 no. I just thought, I just thought, I said, I know what you thought, brother. I know what you thought. <laughs> All right? So, folks, this is, this is 1997, 1998. All right? So the profiling, has, it goes on. It takes a lot of forms to Donna's point. Uh, and so these, these converging forces around the role that government can play with official uh, bodies and institutions, law enforcement and government agencies right. that, and, and even private sector agencies that take federal and state funds that you can Absolutely. regulate as well. Uh, but then also what goes on in our own private behavior and how we profile each other yes. um, is another part of that problem. Right. So let's move on to the next topic. Um, 
so we've got a lot of research, including a 2016 Pew study um, that shows that the black-white uh, gaps in social economic indicators um, have not uh, budged in many cases since the 1960s. Uh, blacks lag behind whites in home ownership, household wealth, median income. And so the research is really clear that there's this gap. So the question is, what is the, the best thing that government could do or should do, if anything, to address economic inequality, particularly between the races? We, we have to foster a culture of economic prosperity, economic growth. We have to train, um, we have to retrain our workforce. We have to, you know, create more what I call uh, economic mobility. Uh, we need financial literacy. There's a host of things. There's a reason why my generation uh, is doing better than my parents' generation. And part of it is that we've been able to get a college education, a college degree. That has been helpful. But government has a role in fostering economic development, economic growth, uh, and ensuring that we have what I call a circle of opportunity so that people who are left behind. You know, in our society, we have left so many people behind, black and white uh, included. People who, and some of them through no fault of them all, their own, they have not been able to climb that next step of the, of the ladder. Uh, and to create wealth, we know you have to uh, not only have opportunity, but you have to have, in some cases, training and, and, and job, uh, the ability to, to grow, uh, to grow your wealth. I mean, I told someone recently, Michael, and I had a, I had a, a nice laugh. I come from a family. My mother was a maid, my father, Janet. They managed to put eight out of nine of us through, through high school, I mean, get us through high school into two and four year college um, throughout their lives. And the reason why is that they work hard. I mean, I saw my mother and my dad, they work hard. Uh, to make ends meet and to provide that, that opportunity for my siblings and I. And I have tried to do the same with my nieces and nephews. And uh, just recently, somebody came to my house. I ordered some, uh, uh, some Greek food because, you know, I, I'm a Louisiana and I like to eat food from every region and every culture. And the guy said, boy, you got a big house. I said, really? You think this house is big? He said, yeah. I said, well, you should have seen the house we all grew up in. We had four bedrooms. He said, really? I said, yeah, this only has three. And so he was looking at my house and I was, my dad built you know, the house that we, were, we grew up in. He added and added the more kids we had. And I looked at this guy and I said, wait a minute, let me, let me tell you how it happened. I came out of college with, with a little debt. I paid it off and every month I saved $100, $100 for 10 years and I bought my first house with a down payment of $10,000. This is my second house and clearly my first house, blah, blah, blah. After the recession, black wealth plummeted. Just as a direct result of the, the lack of uh, uh, home ownership, the, the fact that so much black wealth was tied into the subprime. And if you don't have home ownership or some assets, it's, it's, gonna be, it's hard to, to create and, and, and get more wealth. So government has a role to play, I think, in, in terms of neighborhood revitalization, when we allow people to come in and buy up big pieces of land and build high-rise condominiums. We need to also use some of the subsidies of the government money to provide uh, affordable housing so that people can come in uh, into the circle of opportunity. There are many ways that I think government can help, but government is not the only solution. We also have to have public-private partnership, and we also have to make sure that education is something that we we constantly teach our children. Education was my passport out of poverty, and I think that is the best way uh, to improve economic uh, growth and opportunities for the future. I uh, come at uh, this particular question um, a little bit differently, and, and I, I agree with the, the, the core of what Donna said, but uh, I want to look at it from two uh, perspectives. Um, first, starting with government. Uh, government is a limited purpose entity, in my view. It has a limited purpose at the end of the day um, because we are the government, folks. All right? It's not the buildings in your state capitol. It's not the buildings in Washington, D.C. The last time I checked, our founding documents start with we the people in order to form a more perfect union. Right? We are the government. The fact that we cede control and power over our lives 
to these institutions and to the individuals that we elevate to represent us is wholly within our control. So to the extent that we have some of the systemic issues that Donna referenced, whether it's education, economic development, we have to hold accountable those institutions to make sure that they are caring first and foremost for the least of these, least of these. That's out of our mutual Catholic upbringing. You know, we have a, a, a theology, a philosophy um, that centers around the poor, all right? And so in my public service as Lieutenant Governor, that was the perspective at which I looked at the role and responsibility I had as an elected official. So when I'm looking at minority business enterprise in the state of Maryland, I'm looking at it from the perspective, how do I manage to make this big institution work for the benefit of the least of these, those who are not having access to the kind of, of um, economic uh, opportunities that others may have for a whole host of reasons. We can get into banking, we can get into um, education for sure, we can get into a lot of these other indices that, that government has some control over, that we the people have control over in a macro sense. So that to me is a very, very important understanding is recognizing government's limited role path uh, and ro role to create pathways to access the on-ramps to opportunity. So do we think that... But there's one more. Okay. The second piece is getting back to us. Jack Kemp, who was a mentor of mine and I admired greatly, always talked about a rising tide lifts all boats. And that has been a core economic philosophy for a lot of uh, conservative economic thinking and, and principles for well over 30 years. But my life experience, having grown up uh, in a lower middle income uh, family uh, household in Petworth in Washington, D.C., my mama was a laundress, my daddy was a truck driver, cab driver, chauffeur, and he cleaned office buildings on the weekend, all right? So that, but what I saw there was not, oh my God, we're poor, oh my God, we're in trouble. What I saw there was opportunity, making it work, finding the pathway. All right? And what I always was bothered by was when something would come and interfere with that access to that pathway, whether it was a government um, you know, official or some rule or regulation or policy. So for me, it's always cleaning that pathway, clearing it as much as possible for that individual to recognize their fullest potential. If I want five jobs, I'll have five jobs. Sometimes it may be out of necessity, sometimes maybe because I'm a workaholic and that keeps me busy and happy, all right? But that's my choice and my freedom. But in addition to have this idea of a rising tide lifting all boats, you gotta recognize you gotta have a boat first. And if you don't have a boat, when that tide of prosperity comes in, you'll drown. You will not rise. And that's what Donna's talking about, what happened to black wealth uh, in this recession. A lot of us drowned because we did not, and this now is getting a little bit inside the family, we didn't take time to take care of our own. We create a hell of a lot of wealth for a whole lot of other people, but not for ourselves, right? We, we invest a lot of time and energy in making sure that this works over there, but not here at home. We have control ultimately of how our kids learn in our classrooms in our communities, how businesses grow and survive in our community, and so what I say to black audiences all the time is, I can, I can blame the white man for a lot of things, but at the end of the day, I gotta stop and go, so how did I contribute to this? Because this black business was here, but in the riots, we burned it down. Or no one shopped in that particular store. We went cross town to the white store or that store, but we didn't shop at the store in our own neighborhood. So this is a two-way street when you're getting into this economic discussion and the role that government can play to incentivize to make sure that that black-owned business has fair and equal access to, to financing, to credit, uh, to all the things that they need so that they can stay and sustain in that community, but then the community has to support that as well. So, you know, government has a role. Look, if, they, if government can find a benefit in building a huge baseball or football stadium, yeah. 
then they can find a role in making sure that we can bring back public housing. Freddie Gray's neighborhood in, ba in Baltimore is losing its public housing. We all know in every major city, we are displacing thousands and thousands of residents. We're dealing with a crisis of affordable housing. We're, we're dealing with a situation where it is not trickling down. The recent tax cuts are not trickling down. The billion dollars that, pe that banks and others are able to save now, they're going to the shareholders. Yeah, it's all and, about shareholders. This was the shareholders tax bill. It was not a, a middle income. And so I want, I want my tax dollars to go toward helping to rebuild these communities. These communities are the lifeblood of our, our, our country, and yet they're, they're suffering because of the lack of attention and resources. And yes, we need to make sure that people understand the tools that are available when government is in, involved, and there can be private uh, public partnership involved. So I was telling Michael in the back room, you know, I was an entrepreneur when I was a little girl. I mean, growing up poor, and Michael is right, we didn't know we were poor until we became much older and right. we say, oh my God, <laughs> okay? I, I didn't mean, know that. Hell, I didn't know that there were other brands of cereal other than cornflakes right. and other, you know. I love my cornflakes. Uh, all co commodity meat and commodity cheese yeah. and a cheese called Gouda. I thought every cheese was commodity cheese. Um, and by the way, that was the best cheese for mac and cheese. Yeah, it was okay, good. that was good. It that was, was pretty good. good. That was government cheese was good cheese. Thick. Thick. Real good. Yeah, man. Oh, you didn't eat butter with it because it came with its own butter. That's right. So we, I mean, we could talk about poverty all day long, but you know, I try to, I try to, I was an entrepreneur. I mean, we were, so I, my, Mr. Jimmy died and I had a, I got a lawnmower. So I opened up a landscaping business. My brothers cut the grass. I got the money. My mother said I cheated them. So what? Um, <laughs> that's what happens when you're a girl. But you thought up the business. So I thought you took the and, risk. And not only that, I kept the lawnmower functioning and I bought the gas. Secondly, my sisters were boring, so what I did is that I came up with a bait and tackle uh, uh, shop, and everybody went fishing down in Louisiana because we have four seasons, shrimp, crab, crawfish, and oysters, and I would, I would bring home all of this money from that and some fish. I also had a recycle because everybody drank. They said it was hot. I think it was other reasons. Right. Uh, and I, in my last business, I was the ace, uh, ace cash check-in service before that became popular. I mean, so by, by the time I got to school, college, I had four jobs. I was an entrepreneur. I tell my young nieces and nephews, I say, y'all play on Game Bar, all these tools. Why don't y'all create some apps? There's an app for everything now. Yeah. And I said, okay, I'm not going to tell y'all in the church what I was telling Michael in the back, but there should be an app for people who are now in the marijuana, the, the legal marijuana yeah. business. We got people in jail because they had one or two joints, and it has created havoc on our community. And now with the opioid crisis, everybody said, we gotta treat them, we gotta treat them, but we didn't treat people with one or two joints. We put them in jail for yeah. life. Well, not life, for years. Yeah. They come ten out, years. And they, 10 years, ten and years. they can't get a job. And now there's an app. Do y'all know there's an app for, for reefer? I am shocked. <laughs> I mean, there's an app, Michael. For weed. I wouldn't know about that app, so. Well, I was just out in California, know. and by the way, in the app, track what you buy and bring it to your bring house. Bring it to your deliver. door, baby. And I'm like, what? And people are in jail all over this country. That's why we should restore people's voting rights. That's why we should give them a path back to the workplace. And we should find housing. If we can make room in our neighborhoods for stadiums, for baseball parks, and look, I love sports. We can make room. They get tax credits when they come in and they make a build a stadium. But why can't we get tax credits for building affordable housing for poor people so that they have a place well, to the, stay? The, the truth, the, the, Don't start well, me. It's Sunday. The, the truth is there's no money in what you've just described. Of course, there's never money there's when no poor money people need it. There's, there's no never money. money when the middle class need help. There's never money. Money is all of a sudden, is now we have a deficit. We can't solve our problems because we're giving well, 700 question, million to the military. And the, and the fighting, it's not going to be on the ground. It's cyber. We have money. We have, but we need the means and the will to solve these problems. We cannot let, well, let you, these problems go undressed. What you need to do undressed. is talk to shareholders then, because this is a shareholder economy, and and that's that's the reality that we live in. That the bottom line, whether you're a Google or a Facebook or anybody else out there, 
uh, if you've got shareholders, uh, you're, you're maximizing their investment. Well, we're uh, stakeholders because we own these Googles and Apples and you do, Tweeting. You we're, do. We're stakeholders too. And our voices should be in the arena. But as was pointed out in the Facebook discussion, uh, at, over the last few weeks, uh, when uh, Ms. Sandberg was asked about uh, the idea of, um, of you know, charging for the, that service, Facebook service, you know, sh her response was, "Well, that's that's a that's a separate piece. That's a different piece. Um, we provide this for free, and and of course, you know, we sell ads and we sell all these other. They monetize. They our monetize. Stuff. They monetize your information. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you a sense of where the economy is. So watching and how the government responds to the Facebook uh, narrative is going to be important. It's going to be important to all of you. Um, you're invested in this economy through your retirement, through your uh, you know, income, however you earn it. Uh, and it, it's, it's going to be an important, I think, new feature, particularly when you get into the space that you had to deal with in the last two or three years, the whole cyberspace, what we see others trying to do to change, not just the political dynamic in this country, but the economic dynamic as well. And that's why being involved and being engaged in our political system is so very important, because who sets the rules? We do. It's we the people, not we the politicians or we the corporations, it's we the people. And because less and less people are involved and engaged, we now have a, what I call elected officials who are behold, beholden to the special interests and not beholden to us, the taxpayers. We can solve these problems, Michael, you and I both know it, but we have to come together around that common table and, and decide what kind of society are we going well, to be in the yeah. 21st century. And what, and what the priority is going to be. And what are the yeah. priorities. So that's a perfect segue into our next section about John, political. Got me up now. We this have. water is finally working, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Did we put something in her? No, I got the in same her, thing she got. Um, we all got the same yeah, thing? We're good. Oh, okay. We're good. <laughs> so we want to turn to our political structure and the importance of participating in our democracy, what you just, just talked about. Um, so we want, let's, let's go to something that's been in the, in the news lately, um, Supreme Court's considering cases in Wisconsin and Maryland about gerrymandering. Yep. Donna, let me send this to you first. What is the right way to draw electoral districts? Uh, Michael, what is the right way to draw electoral districts? I'm pretty damn good at it, so I... I, I... See, I knew he had to uh, answer. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, i tell you, the, it, interesting, I, you know, a lot of people don't know but when I was state party chairman in Maryland, I sued the state of Maryland because of how the lines were drawn, because they took, they were not about the full representation of the people in our state. In a, in a legislative district, you have three legislators, right? So when you go to vote, your, vo your vote is diluted because you're voting mm -hmm. for three different people, one state senator and three delegates. And what I argued was one man, woman, one man or woman, one vote. Mm -hmm. So you get that one-on-one -on -one representation, and uh, I won. And and the and the court, the, the state supreme court, said, "Now I didn't get all my pie, but I got a good three quarters of it." Uh, and a number of lines were redrawn in the state. And here's why I sued, because in my home county at that time of 800 plus thousand African Americans with eight state senators, five of them were white. Now, I don't, I may not be good at math, but I know just by the numbers, that's not how that works out. Right. You know, a, a, a county of 800,000 people, you know, some 80% of whom are African American, your state, legis state, state legislative representation is going to look a lot like that county as a whole. That was not the case. Court agreed with me. Uh, 2010 comes along. Uh, while everybody was focused on Congress, I was focused on state legislatures because that's, that's the truth, that's the reality, that's the bench, that's the future, that's a whole lot of things fill in the blank. Um, and the gerrymandering uh, issue, it was funny. 
I remember a lot of people moaning and groaning about it. And I said, wait a minute, no one seemed to be complaining about gerrymandering when Democrats controlled the U.S. House of Representatives for 40 years. No one complained about gerrymandering. Soon as Republicans got control, everybody started complaining, oh my God, gerrymandering is so bad. How did this happen, right? I said, okay, fine. I get the politics of that. But here's the truth of it. That should be regulated, that should be controlled by citizens, not by elected officials. You should not get to draw your own seats. You should not get to draw your own line. Independent commissions of former judges, citizens, should be the ones who make, particularly in this very polarized political environment we're in, um, because trust me, folks, when the, in the script flipped, and it will flip, it will flip, it will flip Democrats would get back those legislative uh, you know, seats that they lost in 2010. They're already starting to do it. 46 so All right. far. Um, and, yeah, right. Not that you're counting. Not that she's counting. <laughs> so it becomes this sort of back and forth. So let's do like some of the states in the West have already started to do, whether it's California, Colorado, a few others, that are beginning to pull that curtain back and expose it for what it is. I'm not afraid of we the people. I'm not afraid of citizens getting in a room and drawing the lines for their representation. I think, in fact, that should be a big part of your civic duty. It engages you and it makes you pay attention to what's going on around you and who you're electing and who's representing you. And we've seen that bear itself out. I'll be quick. Partisan gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering is poisoning our political system. It is undermining our democracy and it is creating an environment where compromise is impossible. So we have to fix it. We have to be big boys and girls and right. be able to tell the American people the truth. Our political system today is poisoned. It's, it's poisoned by the money, the lack of reforms, and the fact that the majority of voters are now independent. They don't like either one of our political right. brands. And millennials don't even like the, our democracy, 70%. We have a problem, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. and we need to start fixing it. It's gonna be uncomfortable in the short term, but if it's going to help enable this form of democracy to last, <clears throat> then we need to go ahead now and drink the castor oil, or whatever you would call it. Uh, we used to drink castor oil I to know. prevent Please the, the, get, the Remember those days? And I then they would chase it with a peppermint. And they chase it with a peppermint. Yeah, but that's how we, our parents made, made sure we didn't get a cold or a flu. We need to go ahead and take the tough medicine now while we can. And, and hopefully that this will help us in the 21st so century. What, what does that tough medicine look like, though, in, in really practical terms? In the Can you imagine role? taking away power from people who, I mean, look, both political parties, oh boy, here I go. We've had a monopoly on power. Yeah. But we're no longer the majority, I mean, the majority of voters are not Democrats, they're not Republicans. Our brand might be five points higher than a Republican brand, but you know what, we're both underwater. So let's just say that this is an opportunity for some of us who are, I'm not a retired politician yet, or a retired strategist, but I'm still involved in the game, but I don't want to play the old game. The old game, in my judgment now, have bad consequences for the future. And therefore, it's time that we look at how we can make these changes. Is that a third can, party? Is well, that? well, okay, so there's, there is a third party uh, That's an uh, option, but there's route, more. Um, and there are a number of groups that are beginning to form around the country that are seriously looking at that. Here's the caveat I put on that, and I tell them I get asked to advise and sort of give them some idea, having run a, a county, state, and national party. Um, that don't start here. Mm -mm. The problem is they always start to get, they want to run for president. We want to run you for president. No, sit your behind down. We Thank don't need you. you running for president. I need you to run for city council. Amen. I need you to run for mayor. Amen. I need you to run for, uh, for sheriff. School board. School board. Yes. Because that's where you begin to germinate the idea to vote for something other than a Democrat and a Republican. And we say this as both former national chairmen and women, that this process needs to have itself opened up uh, more than it is. There's no doubt about it because it's become lazy, it has become sanctimonious, it has become brazen, and it doesn't give a rat's you know what about anyone in this room. Because the only thing they're gonna count on you to do is one of two things. I'm either gonna scare you to go vote for the, who I want you to vote for, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna fleece you to go vote for who I want you to go vote for. That's, that's the truth of it. 
So how do, you, how do you now break this monopoly goes to exactly what Donna was saying, what I was saying about uh, redistricting. But it also, let me just give you a good example of where the change can come. Parkland. Those young kids oh, yeah. have done something mm -hmm. unimaginable. <laughs> unimaginable. <laughs> and it wasn't, it was nothing more than the idea that we are not taking it anymore. We're just not doing it anymore. So I, the question to you, if you're sick of the gerrymandering, then do something about it. You're not imp impotent in this regard. You're not helpless in this regard. You can make the demands that your governor and your state legislature put in place a commission, an independent body. You can, if you have the ability to, to get um, a ballot initiative going, put a ballot initiative on your state uh, rolls uh, for the ballot box this fall or next year. And if your state doesn't allow that, then change that rule to empower you to bring those types of initiatives. We sit back too much. And wait for others And to wait leave. for somebody else to solve yes. that problem yes. when they're not interested in solving that no. problem, folks. Nope. They're really not. Mm -mm. And I know that as someone who was inside working those levers. So they're not interested in that. Clearly, uh, I think we agree we want more American citizen involvement in in elections, yeah. right? So would you encourage, or would you believe the, the government should encourage uh, same day registration? <laughs> yes? Yes. A pause? No, I, I don't have a problem with, I don't have a problem with anything that gets someone to go to a ballot box and vote. So I don't have, I don't have a problem with it. The only thing, only thing I want to make sure we're all in agreement on is that we protect that franchise because it is the most precious gift that we have as citizens in this country. It is what separates us from a whole lot of governments that have come before us, and it will separate us from a whole lot of governments that are now out there and in the future. Is that voter fraud? Is that and we could do a lot to protect yeah. the integrity of our elections. Just we could start with paper ballots. We could start by yeah. making sure that we get rid of these antiquated machines. We can make sure that our e-poll books, our registration rolls are, are clean, up to date, and, clean. Up to right. date. Right. and that automatic registration is the way to go. I mean, when people go to get a car registration, you got to supply more than just, you know, a face. You got to supply all this other information that should automatically leads to voter registration. And yes, I do believe that we need some form of civic education. Most young people don't even know the value of their vote, let alone the importance and the struggle and sacrifices it took. I believe that we should lower the age of voting. Okay, I'm with the Parkland students on that. I'm a millennial, I'm just uh, 29 years for the second time. Um, <laughs> so I think there's more that we can do to increase voter uh, participation. We have too many Americans sitting behind not voting every right. two years, every four years, and we need to change that. So we want to give our audience a chance to ask questions. So a lot of this talk hinged on talking about institutions that are fundamentally racist and perpetuate systemic injustices along racial lines. Um, a lot of them also correlated with class disparity, but a great many of them did not. How do we communicate problems of anti-blackness in American society to white people who have suffered from class disparities and aren't ready to recognize that, in fact, it is more than that, it's an intersectional disparity along the lines of class, gender, race, so on and so forth? Well, you know, you touch on something, and I'm, I'm glad you ra actually raised the question because I wanted to go to this point going to the very beginning of how you opened up the conversation, you, you talked about the folks who gathered in Charlottesville uh, uh, and, uh, a year ago and the fear that, that draw, drives and drove a lot of those, those individuals. That to me is one of the, the fundamental aspects um, and underlying uh, conditions of the race issue in this country is fear. It's the fear black folks have of white folks, and it's the fear white folks still have of black folks. America still hasn't figured out what to do with black people, and black people haven't figured out what the hell we're doing here in America. And so that, to me, is a, is a quintessential part of getting at all the other issues around race, whether you're talking about the systemic uh, institutionalized racism that exists, 
or the, you know, the way it plays itself out in your neighborhood because of how kids are being raised in that community. Um, we just need to have that honest conversation. I mean, you all remember after we elected Barack Obama, everybody's running around talking about, we're in a post-racial America. Oh, no, we're not. There's nothing post-racial about any of this. And here we are eight years later having a Charlottesville, having a Philadelphia, having uh, you know, the, the type of uh, response to young black men in the community. Um, so I think it starts from my perspective. If you want to have a real conversation on race, please call me. I will show up anywhere, anytime, and I'm ready to have it. Because I want to help white folks deal with their fear, and I want them to help me deal with mine. Because that's how, that's how the only way we're going to get through this. You know, in 1619, there were 22, I believe it was 22 African Americans that made their way to Jamestown. That's right. And it's amazing, we're coming upon that 400th anniversary next year. And I would agree, and I think Michael would too, that we've made a lot of progress, but we, we, we are still dealing with that underlying issue of racism. It's something that our forefathers, our forebears, didn't take seriously when they created a constitution and principles that said, we the people, and then left out a large chunk of us. And, and now we live in a society that every time someone gets ahead, we believe that they got ahead because of their color. They didn't get, a, they didn't get ahead because of the hard work and, and, and then often the fact that we have to work twice as hard, three times, four times. And one mistake sets us back 200, 300 years when one mistake from a white community can set them back only for a minute. There's a lot of anger around race. There's a lot of resentment that we have to deal with. And you know, one of the things I applaud South Africa after ending apartheid is that they were willing to deal with reconciliation. Right, right, right. And I know we don't want to deal with reconciliation, we don't want to deal with reparations, we don't want to deal with anything, but we need to start having real good conversations because 400 years after those first 22 Africans made landfall here as slaves, we need to start having this conversation. And Michael is right. I'm tired of people looking at me thinking I am going to jump on them or if I talk too loud, you know, I'm, I'm intimidating them when I can't still be human. I'm 58. When am I going to be human? My dad lost his, his career. Four bronze stars. The man was perfect on the battlefield in every way, but yet when he went back to home to Louisiana, all they saw was a big, tall black man. They didn't see his medals. They didn't see his accomplishments. And he spent the rest of his life trying to tell us that he was somebody. Of course we knew he was somebody. He was our dad. He was my father. He was our provider. But he was a man. And here it is, 50 years after Dr. King, when they wore these t-shirts to say, I am a man. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? to just have to wear a shirt to say, I am a man, I'm a human being. And I feel for white people too, especially poor whites and other whites, but especially for poor whites who are angry at me because I might ride a better car. Well, hell, I've worked three, four jobs to ride a good car. I used to own a whoop -dee. But they see me in my car and they think I got that because somebody gave it to me. No, I worked hard. So we have to deal with these underlying issues. And the rich and powerful white people who are privileged need to start talking to their brothers and sisters too. Because they're not helping. Hi. And thank you. Hi, my name is Mike Allers Jr. I'm a big fan of actually both of you. Thank you. Um, this question is directed to Michael. I'm a Republican, 25 years old. Um, I have an African American girlfriend and I don't feel like I, I fit in mm -hmm. anymore. I go to my local meetings. I live in Greene County. I'm originally from New York. Um, I go to my local meetings in Greene County, Virginia, and I got booed because I have a problem with Confederate statues. And I have a problem with the people that invaded this town. And how do we rebuild? I, I saw you a clip. Um, of you on MSNBC um, arguing because the, uh, one of the current figures in our party said that you only got the job because you were black. Right, right. But I feel like 
it's cowardly to jump ship, and I'm sure you would love to have me. <laughs> you know I would. Right. <laughs> you say you got right. a black girlfriend? <laughs> you want an older uh, one? You have to talk to her. <laughs> How right. do we stay on the ship without letting it sink? So, so that, that, that is a, a, a very good and a very important question because I get asked a lot, when are you leaving the party? Uh, okay. My friend Joe Scarborough has um, uh, many other uh, former leaders of the party have, have taken that route. I've been a Republican for 41 years. I joined the party before there was a pro-life plank in our platform. I joined the party before uh, Donald Trump decided he was a Republican. Um, I joined the party um, uh, at a time when uh, the, the Republican Party as a whole was under fire for Watergate, uh, was under fire for how the Vietnam War would end, because Nixon was uh, president at that time, um, and a whole lot of other social issues and ills, certainly having dealt with a lot of that. And I decided a long time ago, I asked myself one question, how do you want to engage in this fight? The easy thing to do is to quit, and, I, and I've said this to Jeff Flake and others, that look, stay in and, and, and plant the flag. Yeah, you may lose your primary, so what? You're still, you're making a principled argument because those principles still mean something. I call myself a Lincoln Republican for the very specific reason that it goes back to what Don was talking about. Those 26 Africans who came to this country um, were part of a, a narrative that I think still matters. Frederick Douglass helped found the Republican Party, Correct. all right? So, this has been the political home for black folks since that time. So the idea to ask me to leave my home because some idiots have decided to move in or try to break in through the windows <laughs> tells me I got to stand my ground and fight for my home, for my political home. And it is worth it to me. It's easy to go outside, quit to go outside and throw stones back at the house and say, look at all you idiots and all you stupid people, all you racists, all you this. The harder thing is to stay inside and say, I'm going to kick every last one of you out of here one by one if I have to. But these values, these principles that drew me in as a 17-year-old still matter to me. I've not given up on that. And I think that's still worth the fight. Even at this day, in this day and age, we have majorities. It means nothing if you don't have principle. And for me, that's, that's what this is more about than anything else. So I would say to you, ask yourself, is it worth the fight to stay inside? Is it worth it to stay inside? Go back and think about what drew you into the party in the first place. Now, maybe it could have been something as banal as, oh, a lot of my friends, we got together and we decided to become Republicans. OK, that's, that's not a real good anchor. In my house. Reagan, John Wayne, and then Jesus. All right, guys. So that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> and I get that. In my household, it was uh, Jesus, King, and, and you know. Uh, Jesus, Kennedy, King, Obama. That's in my right. Household. right. <laughs> Not that. But, but I, was, I was the Republican in the household, and I was the Republican for the reasons that my mama told me to go out and, and learn and understand, don't be a Democrat because I'm a Democrat. Um, go out and find for yourself, and I did. And so I found that political home. The question for you is, where is your political home? And it may not be this party at this time. So if that's the case, do you want to stay and fight for that home, or do you want to just you know, walk away and stick a torch to it? I, I plan to go into, um, I plan to run someday. I just want to know that People. Well, <laughs> in you'll our have party people like me out. out here who'll have your back. There you go. So, That'd be great. And I, because I think, I think when I look at the party, it's not me. All right, it's you, and how you and your your community um, comes together around defining what this party looks like uh, into the rest of this century is going to matter more than anything I have to say or do. We can't win everywhere, yeah. but when we do come into office to govern, we want people like you to sit aside us and sit across from us so that we can find common ground. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I say hang in there, bro. Hang in there. Hang in there. What do you think about this money in politics 
and about PACs and super PACs and the unintended consequences of Citizens United, mm -hmm. being able to have that much anonymous money come flowing in, and to have our elected officials in Congress um, answering mostly to the donors. Well, I disagree with the Supreme Court and Citizen United. I don't think money is speech. I, I think money influences politics in ways that Clearly, we have unintended consequences. You don't need a billion dollars to run a presidential uh, election, uh, especially when you're targeting less than uh, 15 states uh, because your goal is to get to 270 electoral votes. And so we spend all of this money uh, through advertisement or algorithms or other techniques to reach a certain group of people because they fit the profile of the people that we know that will come out, and we ignore the rest of the people. Uh, the money has totally, I, in my judgment, it is too much. The special interest, there, it, there's no question that once this money is in the political bloodstream, it is difficult to get it out. I know that people believe that uh, you know, uh, politicians lack resources and therefore we need to give them a, a lot more money, but it's not true. Because now what's happened is that we're only identifying candidates who can so-called self-fund. And so good men and women like the young man we just met may be prohibited from running because we can't find the money. So I hope we need to also put this on our agenda as part of the reforms that we need in our political process. And if we don't clean this money up, then you're going to see more foreign money get, into our, uh, get involved. Because the foreign money doesn't come directly to the candidates. That's legally, uh, that's illegal. But the foreign money is coming through organizations, is coming through C3, C4s, and that is also influencing our political pro process. It's dark money, you can't see it coming through. And so I'm sick of it. I hope that that's one of the reforms that we also put on the agenda that both political parties need to address. I do see money as speech. Um, it's mine, and I put it where I think uh, that voice is, represents what I think or feel on an issue. Um, I agree with you, you don't need a billion dollars uh, to run a presidential campaign. Donald Trump proved that. I can't tell you the countless number of campaigns in which I have worked with candidates who were outgunned financially three, four, five times to one, uh, to one and they won. So the question becomes, uh, for me, when I look at Citizens United, the flaw of Citizens United was simply the fact that they hid the information. And, and it, I think if the Congress wants to do anything in terms of beginning to really set the, the terms of reform, because remember, we had McCain-Feingold, all right, before we had Citizens United, which put all these limits and, and it took the money, actually the mistake was taking the money out of the state parties yes. and the national parties and giving it to third parties, giving it to individual donors. Super PACs. Uh, super PACs. So that started before we got into this space with Citizens United. But here's the rub. Disclosure. Full, unfettered, 24-hour disclosure. I write Donna Brazil a check for a million dollars. Donna Brazil discloses to the, to the dispatch, to the Times, to the Post. I just got a million dollars from Michael Steele. Now, if Donna Brazil doesn't want to be associated with my million dollars, Donna Brazil ain't going to take it because of the consequences that may come for that. If she doesn't mind, she will. But more importantly, regardless of that, you know that Donna just got a million dollars. You don't know that now. You don't know how much money I'm writing from my checkbook. She referenced the $60 million in Illinois. That's personal money between those two candidates. Correct. They can write themselves an unlimited check. That's fine. But I do believe and agree with the core underlying argument, how that freezes out the ability for the young man we just saw to compete in that primary. He's not going to be able to, and his ideas may be the better suited for that community or that state. So finding that balance for me is going to be very important, and it starts with full disclosure. Once you disclose it, then we get to judge the associations you have. There's a reason why we want to know what Donald, uh, Donald Trump's tax returns are. Not that, not that we want to want to see whether or not he's you know, a billionaire or not. You want to see who's he associated with. Where does he get his money? How does his company make money? It's no different in politics. It's no different in a campaign. That same level of full disclosure is, is as paramount as it is to know what's in somebody's tax returns. I'm struck by about three things. One is how much fun you guys have together. 
<laughs> and a friend of ours once said, the way to change the culture is throw a better party, and thanks for throwing a good party today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also struck by two things. One is each of you are saying, this duopoly may not be working, and there's something wrong with how the parties are functioning together now, and how much you agree on. So my question is, in terms of stepping outside of the box, are we ready for something, not a third party, but a new constituency, a new something, in which you guys are both part of the same thing, and we know it, and other people join it? I, I'll just say real quick, uh, yeah. I, I, think, I think that's exactly the space that's uh, occupiable, uh, if, if you allow me to say it that way, that, um, that where there is a synergy of agreement, there's also energy to do something. But more important, where there's a synergy of disagreement, there should be an even greater energy to resolve that. And there has been in the past. Look, we, we, you know, Don and I can tell you stories about uh, the days of Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich. Oh, yeah. And, and, and Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. Oh, yes. In which, those in which those gentlemen, while they had serious philosophical disagreements, found greater energy to get some big things done. Bill Clinton, with the work of Republicans, balanced the nation's budget and set in course uh, for the country, which was a prosperous course. I'm not going to take that away from Bill Clinton, because he had to be a part of that discussion. It happened on his watch, and he needs to get credit for it. A lot of folks in my party, when they hear the name Clinton, damn near pass out. And then, and then they start railing. Uh, that's not my space. Um, likewise, I'm not going to speak for it, but I think Donna Brazil would recognize that, you know, working with Tip O'Neill and Democrats, uh, Reagan as president was able to get some big things done and move the country uh, out of the recession of the 70s and onto a course of prosperity as well. So making, making those types of uh, decisions in which, and I don't use the word compromise because I know in my town it's a dirty word, I'm all about consensus that even as a conservative Republican speaking with a liberal or progressive Democrat, we can agree that we the people matter more than our own ideological corner and, and the fights that we've you know, been engaged in in the past. You know, um, when President Obama uh, went down to New Orleans uh, to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the catastrophic hurricanes Katrina and Rita, I was on Air Force One. And the president asked me to go into the press gallery on, on the plane to talk to the media about the commemoration and what had been done over the last 10 years. And I started to talk about President Bush's role and what he had accomplished mm -hmm. that President Obama uh, also worked on. So President Bush started the rebuilding of the levees at a category two, three. Obama strengthened the infrastructure around the levees so that when the quote unquote power went five, off, right. yeah, to four or five. And then I said that President Bush provided them resources for the Road Home Program, which was about making sure that people could get back in their homes. Well, President Obama was able to rebuild affordable housing and public housing. I mean, the point I was making was that I was telling a story of two presidents, not one. And afterwards, I received a note from President Bush who heard that I had celebrated what he had accomplished. And I told the president, I said, I want to remind you one other thing, because I used to go over to the White House. I got criticized by my party for going over to talk to George W. Bush in the aftermath that, yeah. of Katrina. Yeah. Harshly criticized. If you thought I was a troublemaker after writing hacks, oh my God. That was little in comparison with the trouble I got in, because I refused to wait three years until we put a Democrat in the White House I saw people out of their homes, out of the city that they call their birth, and I wanted to sit down with George Bush. And I'll never forget when I went to the president the last time on January 9th, 2008. I said, I know, Mr. President, I've been here for three years begging you. I got one more thing to beg you for. And he said, what is it now? By this time, we're friends. And at this point, I didn't even know that George Bush could paint, because he used to always do this. I'm like, what is he doing? He was drawing a canvas. I was just talking, like I always do. And he was like, housing. Roads. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> Books. What is that? And he was painting a picture, and I'm sitting there like. And then I finally went to him, and I said, Mr. President, I, I got to do this one. He said, what is it now, Donna? 
I said, you know, I was born in Charity Hospital. My mother was born in Charity. We need another level one trauma center for poor people. And I said, Mr. President, one other thing, and I know you're tired of me, the VA hospital, we also have to bring that back to the city of New Orleans. Ladies and gentlemen, every time I go home, I see the level one trauma center and the VA hospital. That's why you can't get stuck in this little pattern, this little hole, this little box, because you never know when that day comes that you have to go sit in the White House with someone from a different party, someone from a different background, mm -hmm. and say, Mr. President, we need help. And this is what we must do together, because we're Americans. We tend to wait on presidents to do what we're talking about. Correct. You guys have been leaders of your party. You represent we the people. What could the two of you do together now for a new kind of leadership, for a new kind of entity that we've never had before? Well, you know, Michael and I will always remain in touch. When this young man, uh, you know, faced criticism because they said he got his position because he was black, I said, oh, hell no. I know for a fact I never got anything because I was black. Right. Not even free fried chicken and pot pies. So there you go. There you go. I, this is a good man. He is a decent and honorable person. He fights hard for his values and his belief. At the end of the day, what I see when I see Michael Steele is a man who cares deeply about his country, and I'm glad to call him my friend. And anything that he is involved with and I can help him with, oh, I will here. always be at his side. And that's same why here. I'm here today. Oh, absolutely. And ditto. Ditto to Donna. And I think that the answer to the question is the fact that we're here in this community at this yeah. time is how we begin to turn this thing and move it in a direction in which um, you know that there are champions out there who see what you see. Yes. And are willing to talk about it openly, fairly, publicly. Uh, and that's important. You know, I, I, love, I love my party. I love being a Republican for the reasons I stated. It has nothing to do with the current leadership. I have real issues with that. Um, but I know this too shall pass. Just as Donna knows that in the fights that she's been in inside her party, and I can talk to you about, in my perspective, the disrespect that they've shown her. You don't ask someone her like her to just come in every time and fix my problem. You put her in charge so you don't have the problem to begin with. That's what you do. So we've had each other's back in that respect for many years, uh, and now forums like this affords us the opportunity to sit down with someone who represents the voice of a community, yes. who represents uh, the ideas and the hopes of a community in each one of you, and say, we're, we're down with that. We want to be a part of that Absolutely. national conversation. Uh, and what comes after that We'll take advantage of it. We will. But we want you to take advantage of it, too. Absolutely. So, thank you. Thank you. As we leave here, um, offer us just some quick words of hope and inspiration, particularly thinking about what each of us can do when we leave here. What can we do um, to reach more common ground? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I want to pick up where the last questioner uh, left off because I think that that is uh, the cornerstone and the key to everything that we talked about today is civic engagement. Yeah. It's civic engagement. We elect people to represent us, okay? Represent us. Yes. That doesn't mean that we stop being us <laughs> and that we have no further value and that our ideas no longer matter because somehow we've ceded it to the person who has a title in front of their name. Um, please don't do that. Please don't do that. We are, we are too smart and too uh, far along in this wonderful experiment called America uh, to continue to take step, steps backwards on race, economy, education, healthcare, uh, infrastructure, environment. Um, yeah, there's a lot of knockdown drag out fights out there, folks. And you all have your own, own inherent biases and animosities and hopes and fears that, that cobble together in your heads and come out in some form or fashion through protests, through support, through whatever means. But it's engagement. And so my, my lasting words is take the conversation uh, for what it is. It's a conversation between two people who want to share a little bit of insight and thought 
from this perspective. But you're here on the ground. And you have the greatest ability in this state to make it what you want it to be, to be a legacy that's consistent not just with its past, but is hopeful for its future. And that's what the millennial generation for a long time have been espousing. So take up that mantle and that cause and remember your civic engagement in whatever form it takes, because that's how you make the biggest difference. And don't give it to any politician. Amen. Please don't. Amen. Thank you, Michael. And so that, that night before the assassin bullet took him away from us, Dr. King was able to tell us that he had been to the mountaintop. And what he saw was a promised land. And I believe that night he bore witness to what the future would hold and that we could get to the promised land. He said we, we as a people, and he wasn't just referring to black people, I think he was referring to all of us. And so here we are at that mountaintop moment, and we can get to that promised land. We can get there, whether we call ourselves black, white, rich, poor, gay, straight, Christian, Muslim, Jews, it doesn't matter. Dr. King believed that we could get there. So I think the first step today is to figure out how we get there, how you get there, how you encourage your family, your friends, your coworkers, how you do something different tomorrow or even today that will show your willingness to get to that promised land. You've already made it to the mountaintop, you're here. Now let's get there together. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming us to this community and thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think what we saw today was the perfect example of bringing light, not heat, to public discourse. Wouldn't you agree with that?